Welcome to another episode of Anomalies. Uh, this is a show about things that are seen in the shadows. This is a show about things that go bump in the night. This is a show about reality, what it is, and maybe what it might be. I'm one of your hosts, Dan Hall. We're talking to you in the early part of December, so we're in a kind of ambiance here with a Christmas tree and holiday festivities. I'm joined by two people um, that are close to me, very dear to me. My other podcast host, Dave Jinks. Dave, hello. Merry hello, Christmas. Dan. Merry Christmas to you. And our special new person, Sarah Rickerthiesen. <laughs> uh, Sarah, we're so happy that you're able to join us. I'm glad to be here yes. with both of you. So Thank I'm you. going to start this out with tonight's topic by a favorite, it's actually a quote from a poem by one of the people I like and find kind of interesting, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. And Poe um, wrote, I think, and this may be, I'm a little confused about whether this is the title of the poem, but it's also a lyric of the poem. And here's what I want to say, and this will introduce tonight's topic. All that we see or seem may be a dream within a dream. And why I like that is, A, we're going to be talking about dreams tonight, but um, dreams have always held a fascination for me as whether or not in a dreamlike state, what are you really experiencing? Are you experiencing something in your mind? Are you experiencing some part of reality that we don't necessarily think of as being real? But the idea of dreams and reality uh, is going to be what we'll be talking about tonight. A whole bunch of different pathways. So Dave, why don't you, why don't you start us off? What, so what's, what's a dream? What do, you, what do you think a dream is? Well, I think it's uh, <clears throat> your quote is especially fitting for tonight's discussion because you said you mentioned a dream within a dream, and I'm hoping we'll quickly get to lucid dreaming, which is much more fascinating even than dreams in general, because lucid dreaming is when the dreamer becomes aware that he or she is dreaming. It's a dream within a dream, or it's a, uh, an awakening within a dream, maybe more appropriately. But dreams are something that everyone can relate to because we all have them, whether you remember them. Most of us don't, unfortunately. Uh, there's some suspicion that animals dream also. My background, my wife is a veterinarian, so we uh, deal with animals. I'm sure she could give plenty of examples of um, human traits in animals, and dreaming appears to be one of them. So we can discuss what might be the purpose of dreams in animals, too. That mm-hmm. brings up right. intriguing questions. But what are dreams in general? I've uh, read a lot of different theories, and I'm not so sure that anyone has ever come up with the theory about dreams, or even a predominant theory that fits all the evidence. So I'm still not sure mm-hmm. what dreams are. I mean, we can talk about what the different possibilities are. That seems to be a fallback position for most of the topics mm-hmm. of this, these podcasts. I don't know. I'm not sure. You know? yeah. Sarah, what, what are your... Think about whether or not you want to share dreams that you've had. What, what's your idea about what the purpose of dreams are? Wow. Um, I guess maybe this is rather conventional, but I think I've thought or heard that it's like your... Um, subconscious working things out at night so you know if you've had a lot of conflict in your life then maybe you have a full of conflict Um, I've myself I have a reoccurring dream Mm -hmm. that is um, it's always about jealousy I have these intense feelings of jealousy Mm -hmm. and I'm frequently watching a um, ex-boyfriend and his new partner from uh, maybe another room outside looking in but it'll it'll reoccur maybe once a year twice a year and they're just horrible like i i just like i feel like i'm reliving um the experience i think i'm still working on some trauma um Mm -hmm. That might, you know, I don't want to go and that the audience needs to hear about my childhood trauma, <laughs> but I, I think that I, it's my subconscious working on something. I, th- I think uh, my sense of that is that sounds like a Freudian interpretation <laughs> of dreams. It's a way for mm-hmm. the psyche, the id, and the ego. Now, um, 
and I'm not going to dismiss that because I agree with Dave that well, I'm not sure what the answer is. But uh, take that take that example that you mm -hmm. just talked about. So I have dreams, and I'm trying to put some of my dreams. My dreams can be so bizarre <laughs> that I'm riding an elephant in a circus uh, somewhere in the Antarctic, and um, there's a whole bunch of uh, chimpanzees watching me do that. And so I'm trying to think about... Really? Now, I mean, they're that wild. Well, well I, I mean, that's that's not. I, mean, I can't okay, make, I made that up, but <laughs> but what I didn't make up is the inner the lack of connection. Yeah, I, it's it's not a coherent uh, yeah. story or co it's stuff that doesn't really go together. So uh, I guess my question would be, and we're just looking at Freudian psychology as one interpretation. Yeah. How how do you explain something like that? What am I trying to work out? I don't have negative feelings about the Antarctic or chimpanzees. <laughs> well. <laughs> Before, maybe, hopefully, Dave will have maybe some ideas for you. But one thing I would have us consider is, are all dreams the same? Is there just, I mean, could there be a Freudian kind of dreaming that our subconscious needs at some times? And are there other kinds of dreams that are influenced by, I don't know, other things? Mm -hmm. So that's, I don't think they can all necessarily be the same. Yeah, that's. I think that's, yeah. that's a good explanation. Yeah. So, Dave, what do you have? A, what would you say about those dreams that seem totally incomprehensible? Well, I've heard the theory, I don't know if it's still in vogue or the leading one, but the idea of dreaming as the garbage disposal of the mind. I think it was Crick and Mitchison, if I remember the researchers' names stick with me, whether they're important oh. researchers or not, I don't know. But like the names. They, I think they were pioneers in sleep research, and they, they decided or concluded that it's a garbage disposal, which is kind of more in line with what Dan just described, a bunch of sort of random mm -hmm. stuff. But what Sarah described is the kind of dream that we usually remember, and it's emotion-laden. And I kind of think that Sarah might be more correct in that when we're sleeping, our body, first of all, paralyzes our muscles. Mm. So you're not able to act out the, the thrashing and the, you know, the anguish that you're feeling in that kind of a dream. Or I guess conversely, if you're exhilarated or whatever, if you're skydiving or something, you know, you're not going to fall out of your bed or jump out of the window or something. So for some reason... We our brains are turned off from acting out the dream. So, of course, what that does is give us a, a playground in which to act out and to feel the same emotion, because some of those dream emotions are really intense. I mean, you wake up crying sometimes, or elated because you won the the lottery or something. Of course, that's followed by deep depression because you realize it was <laughs> a dream. The <laughs> but it, it's a playground where you're able to experience something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to, mm -hmm. to, to practice experience in life without the consequences. So I think there has to be some merit to that aspect of the dream, the, the dream world. But then again, we've all had the just bizarre dreams that seemed like pure nonsense and chaos and randomness mm -hmm. and what that didn't help solve a problem did it mm -hmm. it didn't really let you diffuse on a emotional issue that you're having right. so what's the purpose of that why why does our brain expend the energy and the effort because this you know it's burning up calories or glucose or whatever it's it's spending cpu you know processing power on producing these this vivid imagery and emotional feelings and muscle impulses and all that so um, I'm not sure where I've landed either I, I tend towards the playground interpretation mm -hmm. as an experimental world where but it may be deeper than that and I hope it is mm -hmm. deeper than that because in prior shows we've talked about the nature of consciousness you know are there other dimensions uh, other intelligences and I like to think whether it's accurate or not that dreams may be a look into one of those other realms hmm. um, let, me, let me tell you two dreams I had and, mm -hmm. and the second dream I'll talk about almost implies a different kind of a theory mm -hmm. and I'm not sure where the first one uh, first one comes from my uh, preteen years 
One night, I, have a, I had a vivid dream. It was so vivid in my mind, I could see this happening. And this was the difficulty for me to distinguish between what's real and what isn't. I was laying in my bed, and I had my hand uh, palm up. One of my hands, my left hand, I think. And I vividly saw in my mind's eye, as what I interpret as part of a dream, as a scorpion crawl into the palm of my hand. And as I watched that scorpion, the worst fear a person could have of the dream like that is that they would, Barbie would sting you. And I woke up bolt upright in bed with my left hand hurting like mad and called my parents in to look all over my bed, under my bed, anywhere they could look to find the scorpion. No scorpion, no mark in my hand, huh. but my hands physically hurt. Huh. Hmm. Not sure what that was about. Fear of scorpions? Huh? Well, the rash, rational answer would be that you somehow had gotten a position where you were really cutting off some blood supply or pinched a nerve or whatever, mm. feeling mm -hmm. that pinch in your brain in that state, All imaginative right. state, said, oh, let's make this a scorpion sting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the purely mm -hmm. rational whatever, but if it doesn't match the situation, and maybe not. I mean, maybe there's a more exotic explanation, which, of course, all we here would love to consider. Mm. But what was it? So that was one. What was the other? Well, the other one, I think, implies a different theory about dreams, and the, the, we talked about kind of a Freudian approach to dreams. This I would classify as more the idea of a gentleman by the name of Edgar Cayce mm -hmm. uh, when it came to dreams. Uh, now, Cayce is viewed uh, very controversially by some people. I mean, he was kind of a sleep... I think they refer to him as a sleeping prophet. Uh, but he was able to see things in the future. And one of his thoughts about dreams were that they were more metaphysical, that they allowed you to travel in other dimensions, almost astral projection. And that, that and this was the part that was really intriguing to me, that they could also allow telepathic contacts or contacts, uh, visit, or maybe the word visitation is better than contacts, uh, by you and people who have passed to the other side. So here's my dream. Uh, there's a woman in my life who is very important to me, and I unfortunately screwed up that relationship uh, badly, you know. And I've always felt real sorry about that. And it's one of those situations where you just kind of say, well, you know, things didn't work out, so you let them go with who, whomever they're going to be with. But this is about a year ago. And I would dream about this person, and I remember I would almost be euphoric when I would wake up because I missed her and uh, there was a way to be with her kind, kind of a thing. So there was, a, and this was about a year ago this last September, three nights in a row I had a dream of this person. And in this dream I'm with the person and they're telling me something. But I either don't hear the words coming out of their mouth or don't understand what the words are. And so I'm perplexed by that. It's like, okay, she's trying to tell me something. I don't know what she's trying to tell me. The fourth day during the day, I see this person. And on my travels throughout Olympia, I run into this person. And we kind of exchange pleasantries. It's a little awkward because we hadn't seen each other for a while. And she said, well, I need to tell you something. And I said, oh, what's that? She said, I got married. Which is not what I wanted to hear. Because I guess <laughs> no. I thought on some level, maybe we could be together. But what really gave me kind of a gut punch was, that's what she was trying to tell me. And she was trying to tell me that in a dream. And that was almost, uh, and I'm reflecting back on Edgar Casey here because it's uh, it's more metaphysical than you know trying to work out your what's going on at work or something like that. It was almost like this person, their spirit. Mm -hmm. That's my interpretation. Came to me and was we're, we were connected in such ways that she wanted me to know that there was this change going on in her life, and this was a pre premonition of what was actually going to happen. She was going to see me and give me that news. Now, I went, whoa, that's a little different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Sarah? Have you had prophetic dreams? I mean, that is something that's in, you know, in the literature, in the, in the common consciousness. We, we have this feeling that, you know, some inventors are said to have invented things in their dreams and made big yeah, discoveries in their dreams. Was it Edison who would sleep 
purposely would enter that state or a, a you know near sleep or light sleep or maybe it was deep i don't know but he he's he napped a lot i think it was <laughs> or was it da vinci anyway, anyway so let's guys? not obviously i don't know who it was specifically but there's some idea that the, that realm <clears throat> is more pliable or potentially connected to a uh, universal consciousness if you know how to tap into it well most of us don't do it on purpose and maybe if we're lucky things come to us in the way dan is describing here may have been a a premonition but have you had dreams like well i have had a reoccurring dream not as reoccurring as the one i described earlier um and it has to do with some kind of educational setting and it's like I can't quite make out the people and can't quite make out where we are, but I, I can hear the voices. And I've always felt like it was some place that I was eventually going to run into. Mm-hmm. And I think when I went to graduate school, I thought, well, maybe this is what the dream was talking about. But then I think the dream showed up, you know, after graduate school. And then maybe it's like, well, maybe it was about working at the Evergreen State College. And then I think it's, you know, even continuing beyond that and thinking, well, maybe it's my work at the senior center um, because I'm involved with education programming there. But uh, now I haven't had it recently, but um, I just wonder because it is like, it's like I can't quite make out what it is and it Mm -hmm. feels like prophetic, I guess. But uh, I don't know. Not really in the way that Dan's talking about. Nothing that Dan's is clear. more specific, although that was very it's still... Specific. It would have been nicer if she said, Dan, I'm getting married. Then you saw her the next day and she said, Dan, I'm getting married. I mean, that would have been... Yeah. But or instead, Dan, will you marry me? Yeah. Are you... Well, that would have been interesting, too. Because <laughs> <laughs> Dan would see her the next go- day going, hey, yeah. getting down I, on one I knee probably, and he's probably, ready to... probably would have fallen over the coronary if that had happened. <laughs> Well, let me take this one step further. Two mm-hmm. things come to mind here. One thing about Sarah just talked about, and maybe this is a dream is an example of um, psychological frustrations that you're trying to, trying to work out. Mm-hmm. But in a previous lifetime, I was a middle school teacher, and I taught in a public school. And one of the dreams that I had, and it's like it's like you're asking yourself, what's the symbolism here? What's so there, there's this, the facts of the case or the dream, and then what's really the talking about? So I've had this. It's a reoccurring dream where oh. where I would be in the teachers' lounge, and the bell would ring for me to go to my next class. I'd zoom out of the teachers' lounge, and then I'd be struck with the fact that I don't know where my next class is, <laughs> and I would be frantically oh, searching yeah. for. Mm-hmm. Um, my next class. And, and that what was interesting about that, in a way, was that it was a lot like a dream that my dad used to have. Huh. And my dad was a postal worker. So he would come in early in the morning, he delivered mail. He'd come in and he would sort all of his letters by addresses so that when he got out of his route, it would be easier to deliver stuff. So he would, he would have this dream he would tell me about, and I was thinking about my dream with the middle schoolers. His dream would be he would have all this mail uh, ready to sort, and he would go to the bathroom, come back, and get ready to go, and all the mail had been unsorted. Oh, so yeah. it was like there was some kind of frustration. Yeah. And maybe it was a frustration for, that I was having with being, you know, teaching eighth graders or something like that. That, that could mm-hmm. give you some frustrations. Well, that's similar to an actor's dream about being on stage and not knowing your lines. Your lines and right. I think every actor has had that dream. Is, of, that, is that then some kind of insecurity? I think it's probably act, uh, working on a fear of, um, you know, actors forget their lines mm-hmm. uh, sometimes. And I, I think it's it, pro- de- it, yeah. it depends on how you define yourself. Sarah would probably have an actress dream where you forgot your lines, you're mm-hmm. unprepared. Dan was having... Or your your dad was having not being able to do his job. You know that's a big anxiety. It's an anxiety dream. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of myself. I'm trying to think. Do I have recurring dreams? And I do. I've, I'm a soccer player. Played for almost forty years. So it's I, I identify myself oh. as a you know as an athlete, but specifically a soccer player. And I can't tell you how many anxiety dreams I've had about soccer, which sounds silly. You know who else? You guys wouldn't just have a random dream about soccer, you know, to express your anxiety. But my soccer dreams go like, 
I'm late to the soccer oh. game. I really wanted to play. You know, I'm in the car. I'm almost there, and I realize I forgot my shoes, my soccer shoes. <laughs> right. And uh, I show up, start playing, and the ball turns into a, a, a rock or something. So I'm trying to dribble a rock around the field, or, you know, there are too many people on the field, or the the goal has fallen over. You know, it's just stuff like that. Yeah, that's so, that that's are clearly what just yeah. anxiety. Mm-hmm. All the things that could go wrong, you know, which really never would. I mean, you wouldn't have your mail magically unsort itself unless right. you had a really bad coworker, I, I guess. But you wouldn't forget your, well, you, you could forget your lines, but you wouldn't go up on stage knowing that you were that poorly prepared, right? Typically right. as an actress. And wow. I have forgotten my shoes in soccer but the goal hasn't fallen over and the mm-hmm. ball hasn't turned into a rock and you know all those sorts of things that are uh, free to happen in a dream and they uh, maybe they just really amplify the emotion that you're feeling you know like oh my god the ball's turned into a rock you know that's that's really anxiety producing if it happened in real life but you're you're free to process that now why does it keep happening why is it a recurring dream it's because that anxiety is ever present, I guess, in a lot of ways, and there's not really a way to diffuse that. You know, you might always, there's always a chance you might forget your lines. Yeah. Oh, as an yeah. actress, no matter how well prepared oh, you are. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, I want to learn more about what this loot. So, we, we've identified a few different dreams. Types of the dreams. Types of dreams the reoccurring dream, the dream that's working out, um, maybe daily frustrations premonitions um playground where things do you mean by that random kind of random well i mean just a a region where you're free to experience because dreams can be very emotionally realistic Mm -hmm. right i mean Mm -hmm. so when you feel really scared in a dream you're really feeling scared in fact it carries into your your waking life for a time we've all had that dream where it just gave you that uneasy feeling for the entire day or something yeah you're thinking back yeah why did i why did i experience that but it's but it's you can always say it's a dream you know one of the all-time cop-outs for a TV show or a movie or a book or something is oh it was just a dream. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, it's you, you got to experience everything, but it didn't count. Reality is actually better, more predictable, and and uh, a dream gives you that freedom to experience. So as opposed to being random, again, random, chaotic, whatever, highly symbolic. That's much tougher to explain. You know why you're riding a, an elephant and the frozen tundra or something you know what does that mean i don't know maybe that's just purely your brain exercising its ability to imagine Mm -hmm. exotic locations or animals or something did you want to sarah did you want to take us in a different well i wanted to (coughs) find out what all this lucid dreaming is about can, can, I, can I ask, interject one other yeah. point yeah. before that? Because I, mm-hmm. I, I'm like you, I want to know more about lucid dreaming. Um, what about visitations of from people who are dead? Mm. Now, the example that I gave you was kind of like this person in my dream is somebody I know who's alive, and mm-hmm. seeing her around every once in a while. What about visitations from people who passed on? Because mm. Casey would say that the dream state, in some respects, lowers that threshold between this world and the other. Oh, yeah. Do you know, have you heard of anybody who's had oh, yeah. dreams from... And I dream about my parents, and I just think, mm-hmm. well, is that my collective memory of mom and dad, or is that my mom and dad coming mm-hmm. for a visit to check on me? My uh, experience with that is I had one very um, realistic dream where... I uh, had lost an uh, ex-boyfriend had been killed in a car accident, and um, that was devastating. I, we weren't like together, but it still was devastating because we were good friends. And it was one year later, but on his birthday, not the death day, I was in a light dream state. It was like waking up time, and he appeared in my dream and just kind of his arms went out like I'm here and I felt like this incredible love like just wash over my body and um, I 
when uh, later in the day I realized, oh my God, it's his birthday. It was April 24th. Um, I've, I definitely believe that's a visitation. And I think you've told me about, I thought you turned me on to, this is a common kind of connection with people who've passed on is, is a visit in a dream. I think that is... That's the kind of stuff Edgar Casey would often talk yeah. about. Yeah. If somebody dreamed about someone in the past. <clears throat> right. They're just saying, hey, this isn't just your recollection of that person. This is that person's spirit coming to check on you. I think, I'm convinced that you will know the difference between a visitation and a dream. I think some of my siblings have had them, and when they have them about my parents, I'll say, do you think it was a visitation or a dream? And, you know, oftentimes it's, no, I think I was dreaming, or no, I think... I think that was a message. Well, so there's that, a distinct... That's the crux, and maybe this is where we get mm-hmm. to lucid dreaming. How do you know, why do you know what's real? How do you know whether something is a visitation by someone who passed on? Or, I mean, there are some stories out there, science fiction stories, whatever, where people are led to believe that the dream state is something that's not real. But what's we think of in terms of contemporary reality could be a dream state. I mean, that, I think that's what Edgar Allan Poe is talking about to some degree. So how do you, how do you know what's real and what's a dream? Well, I, I, there are accounts of specific information being given in a dream that couldn't have been known otherwise. And, you know, although it's, from what I've read, it's, it's pretty rare, but there are cases that are pretty compelling. I think maybe Dean Radin talks mm-hmm. about that in his Conscious Universe uh, you know, there are some resources. But yeah, how do you know? I mean, you you see a visitation, you feel love. Was that just your brain missing the the person who's passed away? Our brains are capable of, you know, of creating intense feelings. Now, whether that was an influence from mm. somewhere else or it was just your own making, of course, is, is really, a, a you know, a yeah. huge question. And then you have to take into account out-of-body experiences near-death experiences, you know, hypnosis, all these other drug-induced experiences. I mean, where, where is the, what is reality and what do these all have in common, these different states, yoga, yogic states, medi- meditation, mm-hmm. you know, Vedic, just all those things. They all kind of focus right in our brains, we, we assume, but the uh, consciousness, however we define that, they seem to have a, a nexus, you know, they merge there, and they all seem to have a common source. So I think where we wanted to go next was lucid dreaming, and I'm assuming that the probably listeners uh, were attracted mm-hmm. to this conversation because they had run across lucid dreaming, or are able to lucid or dream lucidly, or, you know, otherwise wanted a different uh, topic to, to listen to than just your typical dreams, because I think we pretty much covered everything you can in a, a typical dream as far as what can be known about them. But lucid dreaming opens up a, a, a whole avenue potentially towards these other states of consciousness, too, or at least can tie some of them together. So we can talk about that. But it looked like Dan had something. No, I think, I think I'd like to go where you guys would like to go. What's a lucid dream? So... Lu- Let me first say, I have a book on lucid dreaming, and I wrote it actually as a college paper, as an assignment for one of my classes. I can't even remember which class. It was Was a a psychology class of some kind. And I I just was fascinated. I was fascinated with hypnosis and other things when I was 10 years old. My friend and I used to go to the university library and look up books on hypnosis. That's, you know, that's what we did because it was interesting. But I wrote, you know, I wrote a report on lucid dreaming and it actually turned into a book over the years I wrote it over 20 years ago and then updated it a couple years ago it's called How to Control Your Dreams and the subtitle is kind of long (laughs) 79 Techniques Tips Technique is it yes Techniques Tips and Tricks and tongue twisters, apparently. Yeah, tongue twisters. Techniques, tips, and tricks you can use to induce, maintain, and direct your own lucid dreams. Mm-hmm. So how to control your dreams is what you look up on Amazon, and it'll it'll show up there. Right. But I, I did, you know, it's a short book, it's like 60 pages or less, but it's kind of a fun book to read. It talks, talks about the fun aspects of lucid dreaming not necessarily the profound aspects even though we believe that you know it's 
it's a profound thing and uh, to control your dreams is a profound experience. So my first question to you two is have you had a lucid dream before that you know of? No. And the, the definition of lucid dream is becoming lucid in your dreams, becoming aware in your dream that you are in fact dreaming. I don't, I don't think I have. I struggle a little bit with the terminology, the definition, mm -hmm. because I, and I'm kind of being a little contradictory here because I just said, oh, I don't know what the difference between reality is and dreaming. But I could pretty much say I know when I have a dream, and I could. My only problem is telling you what might be the content of the dream. I have problems with that, but uh, with a couple of exceptions, and I would say the thing about the dream about the scorpion. I know, I know when I'm in a dream state. But uh, what intrigues me about this lucid dreaming, the ability to control your dreaming, mm -hmm. is uh, I'm going to throw out an old 1980s science fiction movie that uh, was intriguing in this regard. Mm. Dreamscape with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dennis Quaid, I think, was the actor. But and, mm -hmm. and this is probably taking us far afield from where you want to go, but it, it, it does speak to this uh, idea of being able to control your own dreams. So the plot of the science fiction movie is that the military has somehow learned how to control people's dreams, and not only control people's dreams, but insert people in other individuals' dreams nice. with the notion of allowing these people to assassinate uh, folks. <laughs> and the plot centers around some, um, third, well, I think it's probably the commies, mm -hmm. you know, the 80s. Right. They're trying to uh, insert an assassin into the dreams of the President of the United States. And Dennis Quaid is the character who's then also with whatever technology and I don't remember what the technology was inserted into the president's dreams to stop the assassin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, a cruder version of that theme is probably what Nightmare on Elm Street right? right. Freddy mm -hmm. Krueger don't fall asleep because right. Freddy will be there Yikes. so of course that implies that it's, it's, a, it's another quote real reality that can affect this reality which opens a whole lot of cans of worms of course but when when i'm you know saying lucid dream it's a very i keep using the word profound but it's it's an experience where you're not kind of vaguely aware that you're dreaming like yeah this is this feels weird it's a dream you know it's hazy and whatever i'm talking about once you attain lucidity in a dream immediately everything becomes crystal clear I mean, it's more real than this right now. Oh. It's real. You can look at the wood grain in the table. You can look at your fingerprints on your hands. Now that sounds like an LSD trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, but your hands don't get right. bigger and smaller and twist in the air. Oh, and sure. it's, wow. I mean, it's, it is lucid. That's yeah. the term, so lucid. it's clearer than... Cl normal clear it's crystal clear it's oh, like it's that? like you just went into high resolution mm -hmm. you know when you upgrade your tv from yeah. standard definition to high res it's just like or high definition you're wow. like wow i can see this the sun glinting off the, the football player's helmets or whatever i can see reflections in the the windows on the you know whatever it's clear so i don't know if dan you're talking about that kind of awareness i mean if that's what you're you're seeing then you may have a special talent for this and i would say get right on these techniques right away because you could be <laughs> well, you could be the one man experiment in this sort of realm yeah and i think it is kind of a semantics issue about mm -hmm. uh what constitutes a lucid dream mm -hmm. um i don't know does, does my experience with the scorpion the dream sound like a lucid dream because it was crystal clear it was like it was actually happening well, you you believed it was happening, though, so I would say no, no that couldn't. A dream. a dream is yeah. where you say, "Oh, this is a dream." Like right now, say that to yourself: "Oh, this is a dream," and that's what a lucid dream is like. All of a sudden, you are aware that you're in without waking yourself up. Right. Yeah. Well, what frequently happens is that you're like, "Oh my God, I'm dreaming," and I'm aware of it, and then you wake up. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're... And and that's an interesting question: is why. Does your brain, your mind resist you becoming aware in your dreams? Because it will throw Frightening. everything at you yeah. it can to fool you into forgetting that you're dreaming. So a question that comes to mind, 
and it's just my weird mind how it works. Mm-hmm. Why would that be? A, why would we need to make that connection that we're in a dream? Does that serve some kind of purpose as opposed to some of these other theories that we're talking about? That's like, oh, you get to work out your angst with people or your prophetic visions or somebody's visiting you that's past. So, what is there a? What's the purpose? of a lucid dream why should we care about well, what i think is it's a loophole <laughs> i don't think you're supposed to become aware of uh, it, the dream is supposed to be a like i keep saying a playground where you're able to freely experience real life situations and experience but if you know it's a dream you're not going to have the same response are you you're going to go well this is just a dream so either i discount that or i change it of my own free will and that's one of the most amazing things about lucid dreams is that you can direct and control your dreams. And So would you want to do that to solve a problem? You could. I mean, there are all sorts of things you can do, but your mind almost violently resists you becoming aware. Well, I which think I think gives you keys to yeah. with the purpose of dreaming. Now, I'm not saying that it would be harmful. I don't think there's any evidence that it's harmful to, to basically commandeer your, dream, your dreaming. But... Your brain certainly tries to fool you into into falling back asleep, so to speak, within your dream world. And the way it, it typically does that, it's a false awakening. And that's where you believe that you just woke up. And you go, oh, okay, it was just a dream. But you didn't actually wake up. And we've all had that, where it's like, I dreamed that I hit the snooze button on the alarm clock. And then I woke up later and went, oh, wow. <laughs> And you think you're really up this time, and then you get up and take a shower, and then something weird happens. You go, oh my God, I'm still dreaming. So, I mean, fall, you can have false awakening. I've had like five or six of them, you know. We've all kind of had that weird experience of like, oh, I thought I was awake, and then I kept dreaming, and then I thought I woke up. and But that it seems to be some sort of defense mechanism huh. of your mind to not allow you to experience this lucid state. Well, it... I have to say, I mean, I'm really intrigued, and I kind of want to try it, but it does sound, there's something about it that scares me, and Mm -hmm. I think it's that, um, that it it seems paranormal to me, or uh, I don't know if that would be correct, but it seems like you're messing in an area (laughs) that you shouldn't Mm -hmm. mess in, or something that you're... um, I, I, I sort, sort of, of, put words sort of to does, it. yes. Like, but you um, you are able to do it, and like I said, there doesn't seem to be any harmful consequences. Yeah, you haven't so, heard of any. No, I, I, I've never seen any. I've never of it, seen or... any research that uh, suggests it's harmful any way, in any way. But I would say that it seems to be a uh, almost a loophole, almost a uh, we call it a glitch in the code or something. Well, that's what I'm thinking mm. about. Uh, maybe when I hear Sarah talk about it's something that's maybe taboo, something we shouldn't do. Right. Mm-hmm. Because the mind seems so resistant of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's like a little red flag saying, stop, don't go any further. You know? But it, it uh. will, it, if you, you know, do some simple techniques, it will allow it to happen. So w- let's go back to the purpose. What, what, would, mm-hmm. we use the, what would we use? Who to invented do? it? Who yeah. discovered it? I don't know, but if you read some of the pioneers like Stephen LeBurge, he's probably the pioneer but there are a lot of researchers you know many decades ago who really looked at this in sleep labs they um i don't know if they ever concluded there was a purpose are you saying what why why would you want to do because why would we want to do it or why would the brain allow it i guess well i'm thinking about you wrote a book that had Mm -hmm. 79 (laughs) pt liberation (laughs) things tricks tips whatever to do this why would we want to do it well you you the main reason is just to have an experience. Okay. Okay, the first thing I typically do in a lucid dream, I, I say, oh my God, I'm aware in my dreams. This is so awesome. A lot of times I just look at the scenery. You know, I'm like, this is amazing. My brain is creating this visual. It's just like a computer, how a computer does it. It refreshes the screen at 60 hertz or whatever. So you're in the, what were we saying? The Star Trek, is it Star Trek reference? A, holograph? A hologram? A hologram? Holodeck. Or, holodeck. Whatever. Yeah. Holodeck. Yeah. yeah. So That's you're on the holodeck. It's a virtual reality. Why, right. Who wouldn't want to be in a virtual reality? Well, and that, now I'm supplying an answer to my own question. Why would you want to do this? Because it implies to me if you're aware in your dream and you can control your dream, and I'm thinking kind of a 
a different step, more like astral projection. I don't mm -hmm. know how I would ne necessarily differentiate that from the dream state, other than somehow your consciousness leads your body. You could do stuff with that. Yeah, you all the things we talked about with dreams that appeared by accident, you could actually attempt to do on purpose right. in a lucid dream. You could, aside from just experience, which is what most of us do and and that's enough, you know. It's not. It's not like we're doing experiment, telepathic experiments. Although a friend and I, uh, we talked about before the interview or the uh, discussion here. I, in real life, placed an object that is unknown to him in a shoebox in my back room, and his task is to enter a lucid dream and find that box and tell me what's in the box. So that's a little, you know, it's an experiment that. It's sure going to be a heck of is an experiment that? if he tells me what it what it is, but but would, would that be lucid dreaming or would he be astral? Per, well, that's or, or the question. The other the other thing I was going to say yeah. to add to the same thing is is that remote, which remote feeling may right. or may mm -hmm. can be done in states where you're not asleep. Mm -hmm. But I, I I guess I'm seeing more the utility of this. Well, let me tell you. I'm just you know I of course in the book I do discuss some things that you can. You can do um, experiments, again, you can lift a barbell with your pinky finger. I mean, that's kind of interesting. You can pull a thought out of your head. You could walk through a wall. You could create lightning with your fist. Those are just, you know, a few of the things that I discussed that are very dramatic things that would be cool to be able to do. Well, in a lucid dream, you can do some of those things, and it's very realistic. But, like I was going to say, what I usually do... I can't resist. I, I try to fly. The moment I'm, I realize I'm in a dream, I will... Usually there's a conveniently located cliff or something nearby, <laughs> which is just really interesting that my brain goes there. Let's go off this. I, <laughs> had a, I had one of these dreams last week. I finally... It's not easy to do, but I finally, after a few weeks of really focusing on it, I, I had one. And I, I woke up in it and I went, okay, here we go. And I opened the sliding glass door and I just ran off that cliff and just took off like Superman. I mean, it, it feels like you're flying. It's not just some hazy little black and white, you know, wow. did you fuzzy have a memory. Safe landing or did you not <laughs> land or what happened? Are you still out there? <laughs> yeah, maybe I am in my, my mind's eye. I'm still flying. But yes, I flew like Superman. So, like I said, most people, they that's enough. You can, though. There's some evidence that you can improve your well-being. I mean, you can do... Okay. There's some... I remember one uh, study that the, the, the participants were told to uh, pump iron, to lift, lift weights That's while they were funny. sleeping. And they were... Um, they had muscle... Uh, what do Changes? you call them? Sorts yeah, they, are... they had detectors not detectors but you know electrodes or whatever connected oh. to their muscles to to detect a muscle impulse in the areas that should have been affected depending on the exercise that the, the dreamer was doing and it it worked the muscle hmm. that was being dreamed about so you would never have to join a health club theoretically if you could control your dreams enough you could you could work out in your dreams you mm. could you could could you cure your own cancer mm -hmm. i could you theoretically you could do th give yourself a virtual operation yeah well uh, that's <laughs> that's that'd getting take a little a real sophisticated accomplished well, dreamer but yeah. I don't maybe know. <laughs> when we say too sophisticated um, so as we we're preparing for tonight's discussion I was going well other than what I know about Dave's book I don't know much about lucid dreaming it's totally a foreign experience to me and then I happen to look on a page totally unrelated I do a, a yoga practice called Yoga Nidra and hmm. Yoga Nidra is a different form of yoga and it's more mental than it is physical and so what I do is maybe once a month because they well maybe they offer it more than that but I can only get there once a month I go to the yoga loft in Olympia and I participate for $12 in this yoga nidra and there's a really great guy Doug Adamson and I would plug Doug because he's a great guy and he <laughs> does really good work he he leads me into an altered state of consciousness really? that's, all, that's all I could say mm -hmm. I lie out on my back he starts talking and I've been told this by people around me who I know they say you're not asleep because you're not snoring 
But I, I seem to come in and out of reality. I'll hear part of what Doug says and then I go somewhere else. I hear what part of Doug says and I go somewhere else. And, and what I get thinking about with, uh, with Yoga Nitra, and, and I've seen it referred to as a form of lucid dreaming, but it's, it's this Eastern philosophy about the mind that I don't think those in the West always appreciate, that the mind is an incredible organ, that we can do things with it, that we have, in some cases, no really con concept of how far we can take it. And you're, Sarah, you're coming about healing yourself of a disease or, you know, working out and feeling the, actually being able to see the physical evidence of that. I mean, that kind of, that's there in that, in that idea. The mind is so powerful and mm -hmm. how you could use it in lucid dreaming and other states of altered consciousness seems pretty incredible to me. Yeah, what I what I find so amazing about lucid dreaming is that it does appear to be in that same realm as say meditation that you're it sounds like you happen to be a natural at that. Most of us, and I would say especially me <laughs> myself, I can't I find it very tough to quiet my mind. You know, that's mm -hmm. the first thing you're you're trying to do in this mm -hmm. type of meditation. It's like pulling teeth to get my mind to shut up because mm -hmm. I'm such an analytical person. I'm always comparing things and going through scenarios and whatever I can't I can't quiet it however for people like me there is lucid dreaming mm -hmm. lucid dreaming mm -hmm. everybody dreams if you learn a few techniques and create that situation you are freed of that at least temporarily of that tendency of your mind to just go on and on and create stories without your uh, active participation this one you are actively participating in creating your story so it might be an alternative to meditation, and it might be getting the same to the same place too, mm -hmm. and creating the same benefits, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm attracted to this because I, you know, I you kind of feel good. I, when I, you I'm do not it. good at meditation, and and I know you're not supposed to tell yourself that, but that's just not something that I that I'm good at. I don't know. How about you, Sarah? Have you been able to meditate? Mm -hmm. um, meditate? Yeah, I. Are you? I do. Um, I don't. I did it for about a year. Hmm. I did transcendental meditation, mm -hmm. um, and then I I fell off my practice. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah, I received some be you know benefits like calming down and not being as reactive. But mm -hmm. I need to pick it back up. And I certainly yeah, I I enjoy doing it. It, it feels mm -hmm. good. Well, if you enjoy it, that's good. Like I said, for me, a lot of people like me, it's it's just, it's work. It's such hard work. And I think probably that's how it is at the beginning of any new skill. It's tough at first, yeah. but then you push past it and it becomes more right. more natural. But some people are more natural, uh, you know, at, it's, it Relaxing. fits their personality. Their, their abilities are more in line with for what those. you need to be able to do for meditations and, and even out-of-body experiences and all those other different forms of consciousness lucid dreaming again is something that you can learn with relatively few steps and we will go into those steps because i'm sure that people listening are if they're still listening they're probably thinking how can i do this well let's, yes, go, let's, let's go there let's go there give us so some, let's, some steps let's go there but before uh, before we go specifically into that i wanted to mention because dan asked what good is it mm. for? well it's fun is is the main reason that i've seen just that by itself is is the reason to do it just experience your dream world in a way where you can take your time and examine how amazing your visual visualization skills are but theoretically you could use it to say break a habit uh smoking smoking say you i don't know you want to lose weight but you have a chocolate addiction or something <laughs> don't we all yeah but fatal problem you you could in this state uh associate what your problem is or what you're calling your problem with a very negative emotion say in your dream you you hate oysters something but you love chocolate well in your dream you make sure you have a giant bar of chocolate the kind you'd love in real life and mm. you take a bite of it but you tell yourself before you eat it that it's going to taste like oysters or something mm. that you hate it's going to mm -hmm. have the consistency of something that's disgusting to you and when you experience that in your dream, it's likely going to be, as long as you, you know, tell yourself what it's going to be generated, it's it's going to be an uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. It's going to be gross. And theoretically, I carry over into your, you know, your normal life because we know that 
dreams can uh, affect your waking life too in, in an emotional aspect for sure so you could do something like that I've got other examples also but uh, that's almost you like know, a it, stimulus response yeah Psych you, you psychology can, kind of thing you can certainly theoretically do a lot of different experimentation mm -hmm. and, and conditioning that way in a dream but as far as how how do you induce these dreams and again I've I'll be the first person to tell you that it isn't easy because I think of that resistance that your mind uh, typically has for whatever reason. But mostly it's just that we don't remember our dreams very easily. Most of us don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you do remember it, it's easy to forget them quickly also. So the things that you want to learn to do in your dreams you have to do in real life or what we're calling real life. And the main thing is you read things. And by that, I mean you find a book title, a digital clock, a license plate, your watch, you know, clock on the wall. You look at it. Uh, Dan happens to have a book called American Monsters on the table, and I'm not surprised at all about that. <laughs> but you would look at that title, read it, American Monsters, then you look away, then you look back at it. Well, it says it still says American Monsters, so I know I'm awake. However, in a dream, 100% of the time, it will be different the second time you look at it. Mm. For some reason, the language centers during a, a dream, lucid dream in particular, are not the same as when you're in your waking life. Mm. And I believe this is 100% of the time. At least mm -hmm. for me, I've never had this not work. But all throughout the literature, it, it is a tried and true method. So you look at the clock, it says 5 p.m. in the afternoon, you look back again and it says nonsense. Hmm. <laughs> Unless your clock happened to malfunction at that precise moment, you're probably uh, you're probably dreaming. So you, you can double check it, find a, whatever, a, a tag on your shirt or something. I mean, just anything that has lettering, that's a surefire way to realize. Now at that point, when the lettering and the numbers have changed, you go, oh my god, I'm dreaming. That's that's the way, the easiest way, I think, in a dream to become lucid. But again, you have to do it in real life, too, which feels weird, you know? It's like, well, dumb, of course I'm not dreaming. But the funny thing is that one of those times when you do that, you actually will be dreaming. So, and you become lucid at that point, and it's like an aha moment where you go, wow, hmm. that actually worked. Hmm. So if I want to start lucid dreaming... And your your book outlines, I think, the the very first steps maybe that you take. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like you start with keeping a dream diary. Right? It helps to just you know be aware of your dreams and pay attention to your dreams. Definitely, I mean, for a lot of people, that's a lot of work. You know, because you wake up and you're all groggy and yeah. it's like eh, I don't feel like. So just just acknowledging your dreams. If you want to write stuff down, you'll realize how often you really do dream. And most mm -hmm. of us would say, eh, I don't really dream that much. I remember a dream once every month or something, and it's nothing profound or whatever, unless you have a, an anxiety dream or a mm -hmm. recurring mm -hmm. dream that, like you described. Uh, there are different different techniques, but, you know, really that's... That's the most surefire way is to to read in a dream and get used to doing that. Mm. I'm calling it a reality check. Mm -hmm. uh, so could I try that tonight for mm -hmm. some reason? And what? yeah, you should. Just for fun. I mean, you <laughs> you right. can count practice. You know the Don't old. Don't do this at home. Or the, do this at home. The old standby counting sheep. Whatever you can count as you're falling asleep. One, two, three. You know you're. By the time you get hit 159, you may be actually in your dream. But it's the the uh, continuity from the waking state into the dream state. So you can do counting. Um, you can concentrate on a body part, focus on my foot as I'm lying in bed, and try to maintain that focus. A lot of this is meditation techniques. What did you yeah. do in your class? Did you have a an object that you focused well, on yeah. in your mind or in real Right. Life, flame. So that, while we were kind of going on with the conversation, my mind got stuck in third gear because <laughs> I remember something you said earlier. You said you have a hell of a time meditating because you can't quiet your mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I've tried this at home because I don't sleep very well mm -hmm. and I can't do it. I, I, I recorded mm -hmm. a little thing mm -hmm. off the internet 
Yoga Nidra to try to relax can't do that. But the minute I step in that yoga loft and the minute I hear that person's voice, Doug, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I go. Somewhere. You're gone. Yeah. yeah. And what the? And one of the other yeah. questions I was reading about here, and I don't mm-hmm. want to just take us out of lucid dreaming. But right. What does that say about the nature of consciousness? That. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, what does that say? I mean, that. Well, that's I mean, more akin I mean, to hypnosis, really, which is way. another version of uh, just hearing that voice as a trigger. Mm. Yeah. And and it also and alleviates the pressure from yeah. you on yourself because when you're in, when we're in charge of ourselves, it's easy to disobey the teacher because mm-hmm. what are the consequences? You know, yeah. you're just gonna. But if you disobey your yoga teacher, even mm-hmm. internally, you will feel like you've let that person down. And if you have that bond, and again, yes, the space too, yeah, maybe the intriguing. the lighting, the or, or, smells, or the energy, the energy because yoga both. A physical and a mental discipline. Uh, I wonder if there's a space or an energy in that space, and I'm talking about the yoga loft in Olympia. Mm-hmm. That's not here at this place at my yeah. house where I try it. Yeah, you can create an aura. I think, or maybe people. Maybe it's the person. You know, it maybe the person to person connection. This is you know a an individual pursuit. I think here, but I think that. The state of consciousness okay. must be similar to what we experience in meditation or hypnosis or some of these other states that we've talked about. I know one interesting technique I have here which which works for people who may not have as, as much mental discipline and that is to have a, a predictable auditory clue and the one that I use is the uh, garbage men. <laughs> what are they called now? Disposal engineers. What the, the politically correct term, when the garbage people come to get your garbage on Tuesday morning at 6.30, mm-hmm. we've gotten used to it, but it's not enough to wake you up. So you hear the banging of the garbage cans, right? Mm-hmm. And the truck and the hydraulic, you know, of the giant garbage truck. Crusher, garbage. Crushing the garbage. You, yeah. you hear those. Those can serve as triggers when you're in the prime state, which is that half sleep. Because this is really what you want is that half sleep where you're like this close to going into a dream. And you can use cues like that. Or if you're, you know, your significant other gets up to go to work earlier than you do and you hear the typical shower water going or the coffee grinder or whatever, you can use those. You can tell yourself, when I hear these auditory clues, that's when I'm going to pay attention to my dream and try some of these other techniques like reading, you know, because before you know it you will actually be in a dream so that's that's another trick the last resort though is a dream machine and i happen to have one it's a nova dreamer what it is is goggles well it's more like a blindfold that has led the lights in them and it actually has motion detectors in the eye areas it's a velcro thing you put around your head when your brain goes into rapid eye movement the REM stage it can detect your eyes moving the rapid eye movement and at that point it flashes a stimulus at you you can there's various different sensitivities and settings on the, the mask but it'll flash bright red lights and if you set it high enough it'll beep at you so in theory this will intrude into your dream and if you've trained yourself you will recognize the clues without mm. waking up mm. now it's incredible what your brain can do with that stimulus coming in through your eyelids. I mean, it will come up with the most elaborate stories to explain why there's red lights flashing at you and why you're hearing this beeping noise. (laughs) So, again, your brain will most likely try to fool you, will incorporate that stimulus into whatever story your brain is busy narrating at that point. But, if you train yourself well enough, you can usually associate hey red light that's my dream my nova dreamer and at that point you try some of the techniques reading something and and you can become lucid so there is that it's really hard to find these masks unfortunately though and how much do they cost and they're not cheap i mean it's like a hundred or two hundred bucks or something that i've seen even on ebay 200 plus this one i happen to have i mean it's literally like 20 at least 20 years old Mm. still works it was manufactured well apparently Mm. but that's something you can you you can use that's you know much more direct stimulation you don't have to have as much mental discipline 
again. <laughs> this is all about making it easy to enter that state. But anyway, that, that was my last point on the how to induce. Uh, although I should touch on how do you, once you're in a dream, like I said, most of the time you, and I think Sarah says, like, this is so exciting. And a lot of times that's enough to wake you up. Mm -hmm. Because it's just a very, it's an odd, it's an exhilarating feeling, but it's also, it's like a nightmare. You have a nightmare and you hit that climax point where it's like, oh, the murderer is coming to stab me. You wake up at that point because that's the height of your emotional uh, moment in the, in the dream and attaining lucidity is kind of like that. A lot of times you'll you'll just wake up and you'll be like, ah, I almost had it. But you can maintain it by, of all things, spinning. Spinning, like literally twirling your body around. Like a kid on a, you know, running through a field, spinning around. And in your dream. In your dream. You spin, okay. You might wonder, why the heck would that work? Well, apparently <laughs> it, it, because your dream does have connections to your Physi physiology, it apparently um, activates your visual, possibly like your inner ear, your your uh -huh. balance uh, centers of your brain, and what it does is it basically refreshes the scene. Huh. You know, when you spin in real life, what right. happens? Well, the scene whirls around, it kind of blurs, and then you stop. Well, if you do that in a dream, the scene will blur, it will refresh, give you a new scene, and you can maintain lucidity that way. So, I've, I mean, I've done the spinning thing six or seven times in one dream because I wanted to prolong it, you know. It's just like I felt myself waking up and you, you start the spinning. Um, you can also look at your hands, really focus on detail, focus again. And the, and the key, the thread that runs through this and all meditations is the focus thing. You know, you're you're trying to focus on a burning flame or what. Does your class have... Well, a lot of yoga is focused focusing on your breath mm -hmm. inhalation and exhalation mm -hmm. now because lucidity is very visual obviously uh, I think it works to focus on real fine detail again I like to like try to look for my fingerprints on my hand because mm. you're forcing your brain to really go to that tiniest of resolution the mo the highest resolution and somehow it, it'll make your uh, it, it refocuses you and mm. can keep you in that state so anyway, I think Dan had further question, or uh, moving into a different area now. Well, no, I, I was just thinking about this broader issue of consciousness, but I'm also thinking that's a totally different show. Mm -hmm. I guess there's so many different aspects of that. What, what uh, do we want to make any conclusions about dreaming, or do we want to make any conclusions about lucid dreaming? Well, I, I think lucid dreaming opens up an avenue potentially to these other kinds of consciousness and what we've talked about in past shows too. I mean, is there are there possibly some answers to be had by exploring this realm, and what connections might there be? Well, just from a, a newbie to all of this, it sounds like you are creating an altered state um, when you do lucid dreaming, some kind of altered state. It reminds me a little bit of hypnosis, the little I know of hypnosis. Um, and what your your question though is, um, I'm sorry, where would we go from here? Or kind of does it connect to other subjects we might explore? What you well, repeat, I mean, we what talked you about the near death experience. Uh -huh. You know, where where do people go when they die on the operating table and they, their all their vital signs say they're dead, but they obviously were having a rich visual or otherwise sensory mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Do they go to the same realm where you are in a lucid dream, or is lucid dreaming a you know a close by neighbor, or is it a totally different thing? Right. You could do experiments in yeah. in dreams, personal. I mean, anyone here can be their own scientist or experiencer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of my friends, he, the person I talked about before, he's been doing a lot of self experimentation. He wanted to talk to God. Mm. That was one of his. Wow. You know, why not? You're in that state. You use any of the techniques that I have in the book, and uh, I think he used. Uh, Anything that changes a scene, basically, in your dream, walking through a doorway, walking around a corner, spinning, like I said. I think he chose to go up over a hill, and oddly enough, God, to him, appeared, and I think I told you guys about this before in another conversation, but God was toddlers in multicolored jackets. <laughs> 
And he said, but the toddlers were invisible. That was the funniest thing about it. He saw these jackets, you know, bounding towards him through the field, and there was there were no beings in them, but he knew that that was God to him. He just knew that inherently. There, yeah, the very creative interpretation by his brain. You can argue that's just great imagination. Right. He definitely has great imagination, mm-hmm. but he was aware at the time. It wasn't just a randomly generated dream. It was something that he asked for. Mm-hmm. And so he did talk to the the jacketed toddlers, which just <laughs> cracks me up. That's what his brain came up with. And he, he actually said it was a really interesting and profound experience to him because he got some answers in, in about things in his life that he was struggling. So whether that was a personal experience or a direct contact with some other realm or being, again, it's tough to say, but it's certainly ripe for experimentation, mm. you know, for anybody who wants to try it. So I think we all want to try it, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> or is everyone scared that, oh, my, I'm going to blow well, my brain up? It, because... it does make me nervous, just like I would be nervous if someone said, take a hit of LSD. <laughs> right. right. You know what's going to happen. Yeah, because you are you have no control. Right. And I guess I'd be afraid that I'd be in a zone where I wouldn't have control, but it sounds like you have more control. Well, that's the... That, yeah, that's the... The point. That's the point. The, well, that's the the it's oxymoron. The, no, what's, what's the word? Paradox. The con- yeah, the paradox. That's it. You're awake in your dream. It's mm-hmm. just like a dream within a dream. Awake. But yes, it could be as boring as sitting at a table yeah, having a conversation. Right. I mean, you, dreaming. at that point, you decide. How do we know we're not dreaming right yeah. now? And one of the really interesting things that happens, and you will really appreciate this, Sarah, being an actress, is that the moment you attain lucidity, if you have other characters in your dream, essentially they stop. They stop acting. It's like they've been discovered or something and you're the only one and you're the you are the director at that point and it's it's really it's an odd uh phenomenon they they it's almost like they become cardboard cutouts or something that's how my friend described his experience he said as soon as i attain lucidity whatever was going on up to that point the play was over and they and they kind of waited for instruction from him wow which is eerie yeah but also sort of fascinating yeah <laughs> because it implies that your brain constructed a reality and then all of a sudden it was unmasked or discovered that it was you know playing out this fantasy and you were sort of an unwilling participant in the fantasy so at that point yes you have more control mm-hmm. and you can um you know do what you want until you wake up well i think we need to um continue in future podcasts, um, this the whole dream realm. I think there's um, we might be able to invite some other guests in who've either either done the lucid dreaming also, or people who, you know, study or interpret dreams. Because I think there's a lot here. I don't think this will be our last one. What do you think? Well, I think I think it goes back to that. This is just an aspect of consciousness. Yeah, and that's a whole just. Mm-hmm vast expanse of kind of different kind of conversations so yeah maybe we and, need to bring the hope, yoga guy in yeah it would be yeah. interesting yeah. Yeah. well i wonder what the yogic perspective on lucid dreaming is because i know that it goes back centuries millennia mm. this this is a phenomenon that has been known it'd be interesting i because i don't know if it's been used in specific ways you know like meditation has been and these other rituals and and types of consciousness have been exploited or least examined so hopefully before by the next show you all of us will have had a lucid dream where we can say here's what happened in my experience Mm. here's what happened when i asked to talk to god you know that that should be a goal of it i don't think it's scary what's scary about toddlers in it what if god was charles ah dan (laughs) now everyone's going to be turning us off you got to have a real active imagination if Mm -hmm. you that's who shows up in your dream but i have a feeling it, it won't be like that because lucid dreams don't turn scary yeah. i've never had one you that's control. scary yeah. you you control. direct it huh so hopefully our reader our listeners will uh potentially do some more research into this and and have some of their own and maybe they'll even let us know about it that we'd yeah, be you know, glad we, to hear we might want to mention i don't know that we've mentioned that and since you're 
more responsible for it than maybe Sarah and I. We do mm-hmm. have a website, controversialscience.com, mm-hmm. and I think there is a email component to that, correct? Mm-hmm. What's that? Give us the email component. Uh, contact at controversial-science.com. There's a dash in there. But you can go to the website and, and find a link and let us know. So if any, any listener has has some of these experiences, we'd right. be glad to include them in our next show on this subject. And hopefully Sarah and Dan will will have their own, because I guarantee once you have one, it's, it's not something you easily forget. I still remember my first one was like 1986. Wow. And I flew in it again. I flew over my, my hometown in eastern Washington, which is surrounded by wheat fields. And I remember the feeling of soaring over the wheat fields, and it was exhilarating. And I'm still talking about it, what, 30 years later. Mm-hmm. Wow. So it's, it's an experience that stays with you. It's a really neat, uh, which tells me that it is something important. I just don't know what it is yeah, yet right. <laughs> that's important about it, but gotcha. it's so fun. If, if you're listening to this podcast and you do have an experience, whether it be about lucid dreaming or any of the other uh, topics that we talk about, drop us a line and contact at controversial-science.com. Yes. We'd like to know about that. Well, as usual, this is a program that stimulates my thinking, and uh, I'm not sure whether I'll have a lucid dream or not. I think I might try to do that. Um, we like to explore the fringe of reality and anomalies, and I think what our dream state is, what we could do with it, and the um, level of consciousness it represents as part of that reality. So I guess I'm going to say to our listeners, if you, well, I, well, I want to be politically correct, I guess. Yes, I want to say Merry Christmas to you, or Happy Holidays, or whatever tradition. Happy Hanukkah. Yeah, that you follow. Um, it is an interesting time of the year. And we'll be back at some future date with uh, another thought-provoking topic on anomalies. Dream.